Welcome to the Too Much Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take a big-ass book, break it down section by section, bit by bit, talk about it, joke about it, have fun with it, analyze it, do whatever we do. This season is The Remembered Part by Rodrigo Frazan, which hopefully everyone, even if you're not watching in here, which is the sound of me slapping this giant beast of a book, um, written by Rodrigo Frazan. It is the third part of the part trilogy. Um, the other two, the invented part and dream part, are in earlier seasons. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. Hey, you know, hearing these intros over and over again really kind of kicks me in my uh, in my rear end and makes me want to finish my book so I can at least have a different thing other than the stupid Joy Time Killbox every time. How many? How many? Have you done nothing else with your life? You know. <laughs> You, you don't you don't think that I every week I don't think well hopefully next time <laughs> we'll get Brian to do the next one so I can yeah, use a I'm new right. title yeah <laughs> I feel like an ex writer is what I feel like every time you say that <laughs> I'm a perennial next writer so that's that's yeah. gonna be better <laughs> an yeah. at least you wrote <laughs> at least you had a write. You had a yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. How, how, how are you doing this week, Brian? <laughs> oh, not bad. Hanging in like uh, everybody else. Are you still in Europe or are you back? I'm never coming back. Um, yeah, I'm okay. still here um, and, in, in Latvia. And I actually have a few things I want to share uh, before we get oh, started sure. that, might, that might seem unrelated to this section of the book, but I think if you bear with me conceptually, they will end up being related to this section of the book, um, which for anyone uh, who's following along and hasn't read, we are up to page 563 um, for today. We're getting there. We're rounding that last turn. We're into that last quarter mile. I've been watching a lot of Fast and the Furious, so every quarter mile reference and or car metaphor, you can thank for that movie franchise <laughs> for, for implanting into my mind. But you know, oh, I, I just have to say, right. along the, along those lines, I'm totally ride or die for Frazan. I will I will read him a quarter mile at a time, ride or die, mm. all day or day, whatever. Um, anyways, I am here in Latvia still, and yesterday I had the opportunity to meet someone who I want to make sure that everyone on the podcast is aware of is Andre, who runs the blog The Untranslated. Um, which, if you don't know, Brian, you should. But The Untranslated is a review review website that basically reviews very difficult books from nine different languages. He reads them in nine different languages. I don't think he's reviewed books from all nine quite yet, but does re read in nine different languages. And they are the books that are like phrase on, on steroids, like, you know, the Finnegan's wake of, of Mexico or of Croatia or whatever language he might be. The Croatian is not one of them, but, um, but uh, German, Latvian, Russian, so on and so forth. And he lives here in Riga, so you had a chance to meet him. And we've been talking so much this season about what makes a book difficult. And one of the things that he said that was very interesting um, was that he likes to review these books and pay attention to these, like, mammoth, difficult, like, you know, just the really, truly complex works of literature, ones that have invented languages, ones that have, like, you know, uh, various uh, structures that go well beyond what you consider like a normalized structure because we have, as a culture, become so uh, like obsessed or, or um, just enthralled with the simplicity of things that these books would stop to exist because no one will pay attention to them. That the, the truly difficult, the truly ambitious, the truly like, you know, ground, like epoch changing you know, once in a lifetime sort of like all in book will be hard to come by if nobody pays attention to it. And his his definition of difficult, I think, would be a little bit different than what we've been talking about in regards to Frazan. But I thought that was a really interesting point and it sort of like re, re like reinforces what we're trying to do here with two month review, even though I don't think what we're reading is quite on the same level as the sort of books that he's, uh, uh, you know, writing about, which I can't even I, I can barely write. Uh, but he's writing about things that are like barely comprehensible. So like, kudos, kudos. So uh, cause those, it talks about in this section too, um, the idea of reading, but it's rereading. 
and not enough people reread. And especially with difficult literature, it requires rereading or it requires a future, as it talks in here, a future reader. And, mm-hmm. and maybe that's what makes a book difficult is that it requires a future reader to be reading it. And I don't know, we're, we're at a time and place where people, uh, in some ways, books are kind of like trophies. Like, why would I reread a book when I can try to read more books? And so I, I, I'm wondering if maybe that's, that's part of why these, why these things disappear. Do people want to take the time to, gosh, if I have to read a book three times, I could read three different books and get credit for having a knowledge, like a little pat on the back that I've done these three books and I've moved on to the next one. Or I'm on to the next one on my list because I have my stack of books I want to get through. Um, I I have to say one of the times, so like we just had a a really, uh, really remarkably positive review of one of our books in the New York Times this week. Um, The book being Not Even the Dead by Juan Gomez Barsana, translated by our mutual friend Katie Whittemore. Um, Really fantastic book. Very interesting. Would fit in here um, quite well. And the review in the New York Times referenced Cormac McCarthy, referenced Bolaño, referenced jo- Joseph Conrad. It's like the most stellar review that we've ever gotten in the Times and like, you know, really took got to the heart of the matter, really took it seriously. But um, so I, I, I feel bad sort of saying this, but one of the New York Times reviews that one of the first ones we ever got for Open Letter Book was for the third book in a trilogy by Jan Sharstad, a Norwegian writer. And the book was called The Discoverer. And the three books in the series, The Seducer, The Conqueror, and The Discoverer, are each set up with their own sort of uh, uh, format or their own structure. So one of them is like a fugue, the next one's like a, uh, I think the next one's like a spiral, and the third one's like a mosaic. I forget how it goes exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, the beginning of the review in the New York Times was, was basically, it was for the third volume, and it was like, fuck this assignment, because I don't want to read 1,200 pages to read these 600 pages to write this review. So basically, like, fuck this book was was the entirety of the review. And it's like that lazy. <laughs> and that sort of like, that sort of like, I won't read or reread or do anything to make, to contextualize this art because it's a burden to me. I need to check more boxes off on my, like, you know, no one's going to be at the water cooler talking about this. I need, I got 19 Mad Men to, to binge watch right now instead of actually taking art seriously. But um, yeah. but so yeah, so what you're saying totally true. I did for anyone who's watching this or who views it on YouTube. If it's if you don't, if you listen to the podcast, I'll make sure to send the show notes. But I included a link to the untranslated um, website and to the Patreon to help support him to continue doing these endeavors. For example, one of the things that he did that I think is really remarkable that I want to just bring more attention to is that there's an author Fernando Del Paso who's published by Del Key Archive. We're going to be redoing some of his books in the not too diff- distant future. Um, and he's a really experimental, strange Mexican writer. Always like he is like he was mentally, you know, challenged in various ways, uh, schizophrenically, seemingly um, at various points in his life. But he uh, wrote a book called Jose Trigo that um, Andre just led a reading group of. And Jose Trigo, every like third, fourth word is essentially an invented word in Mexican Spanish. And so he created a glossary that's like 300 and some pages long, trying to understand and explain all these inexplicably difficult words, which is just something he did for this book club, took months and months and months, hours and hours and hours, and like made that reading possible. And that's the sort of thing that I think is really valuable and that we should be supporting as a culture and supporting as, uh, as uh, uh, people who are interested in this kind of literature. Well, except there is a quote. Um, there is a quote in this section that does say, "I don't have time to read books outside of my country." So. <laughs> Speaking there, of country, there, there are so many gems in this section. <laughs> this section is loaded. Because if, if you're uh, assuming you're listening to this, you're you're a nerd about reading. You're probably a nerd about writing, and like this is just a nerd out. This section is a complete like absolute deep dive and just writers on writers on writers on readers on meeting other writers and then having to deal with readers uh that's that's great <laughs> sorry I, speaking of nations and i think one of the other things that the section goes back to that re, that that sort of circles back to one of our earlier conversations is about how is the relationship with autofiction again 
and with stories that were told and that are being retold. And to that end, I want to do one other segue um, from Andre and just tell you, like, this is a setup for a joke, but it does fit into this book, is that uh, Andre also was saying, we were talking about being in Riga, and I was like, you know, for a while it was pretty difficult because, like, I, I mean, I, I do love it now. I love Latvia. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great to be here. I think that everything's great. But, like, it is difficult because there's, like, a real wall. Like, you, <laughs> you know Kaya. I know Kaya. There's, like, a lack of facial expressions in most interactions <laughs> in normal life. And that is the commonality here. And so I was telling him, like, it's really hard for me to, like, you know, not have interactions. And he's like, oh, you know, the thing is, like, he's like, there's two things. One is that if you say hi to someone at one point during the day, you never say hi to them again. So you can see them at the beginning of the day. You're like, hello. And then see them 10 hours later. Do not acknowledge that you have not seen them for 10 hours. It is you just go on with your day. And the other thing is that if you if you make eye contact and smile, it can be seen as aggressive because smiling just for pleasantry or for like that sort of normal, you know, secondary affirmation, that's not that's not a normal part of life here. It is it is just that you laugh if it, things are funny, but you don't look at someone and say, like, so I've been going around like assaulting everyone in this town. <laughs> Stop. So after so after I saw him, I was walking home and I saw a sign and it turns out that Riga FC, the football club, Riga FC, there's a bunch of football clubs in Riga, but Riga FC is a relatively new one from 2014 and they won their league or came in second last year. So they are playing in the uh, Europa Conference League qualifying rounds to make the Europa Conference League, which for anyone who doesn't follow soccer the big leagues have like a European competition for all of Europe called the Champions League. If you're good, if you're like, you know, a good team from a, from Spain or England or wherever you get to play in that. And then if you're like Tottenham or someone else who sucks like Liverpool, you play in like the Europa League, which is like second rate. This is the league way beyond, way below that. This is the lowest of the European leagues and they're trying to qualify for it. So it's not like the stakes are extraordinarily low. And it just so happens that they were playing uh, uh, Viking Door, Viking Door from from Iceland, from Reykjavik. So I got, I went to the game to see like the last two major world capitals I've been to, Riga and and Reyk Reykjavik, play each other in this like little clash. And I got seated next to my ticket was next to four Icelanders, and the Icelanders <laughs> screamed over and over and over again. So the team from Reykjavik is V I K I N G. D-U-R, which we would generally pronounce Viking, Viking. They're Vikings, right? Vikings from, from Iceland. They screamed at the top of their lungs for two hours straight, Viking door, go Viking door. I could not stop laughing. Like, you sound like a hidden person gnome. Like, what are you doing? Like, that is the least intimidating yell I could ever imagine. Viking door. It's more of a war shriek than a war cry, huh? <laughs> yeah. but, but Riga wins. So Riga wins 2-0. Riga wins handily. This is still like, who cares? It's the third league. It's They're playing Viking door. And, um, and they win. And nobody smiles. There's no emotion in any part of the leaving. There's nothing. Which, and now, now I come to understand means that they're very happy. And the reason I bring these two things up is that as a segue into this, like we can, we can, we can go through the book or we can jump to the two parts that are really, that I think are, are, are most of this point um, are, is that this is another, re, this is another iteration in the Frazan world in which he's taking his real life experiences, transforming them into fiction and using them as mm -hmm. illustrations to something. So as you yeah. know, because you were there, I was there. Um, Rodrigo did come to the University of, Rod of Rochester and gave a, he didn't give a speech is what he says in this section of the book. Um, he did give a reading. He gave a conversation with Will Vander Heiden. We all went to dinner during the dinner, or I think it was during the dinner. We told him that, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's, um, the model for Billy Pilgrim from, from Slaughterhouse five is from Rochester and is buried in the cemetery across the road from where Rodrigo was staying across from his hotel. 
So he went to see the, the, the grave. He took a selfie. He sent it to all of us. It's the only selfie he has. Is in front of Billy Pilgrim's <laughs> he was He was very ashamed, if I recall. So he's not going to like super- it. If he, if he hears that this came out in public, he'll be very upset. But yeah, he was like, I will never do this again. Here's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in front of, in front of uh, a grave. Yeah. And, and so that's in here. That core, of, that core essence is in here. And I, and I want to mm-hmm. get to that and talk about like what he does to like frill it up and to change it from like reality to, to fiction. And then the, the follow-up though is that he uses that Vonnegut thread that key is then like the next section is about about the writer being in Iowa giving his book to Vonnegut, which is the fucking exact story that Frazan told us over dinner when he was in Rochester, was seeing yeah. was being in a cafe, seeing Vonnegut outside of the window, taking his book to Vonnegut, telling him, hey, you know, I wrote this book, you're a character, having this interaction, Vonnegut walking off and him assuming that Vonnegut just threw the book in the trash. It just kept going. And again, that story is almost verbatim in here too. So like the way that yeah. like he converts these things and makes it into the writer is is interesting because it it is like everyone writes write what you know, the autofiction trying, whatever. This is something different, I think. And there's something about it that's like a playfulness of like the constantly gathering of material that fits into this guy's viewpoint um and and way of dealing with the world. But I have talked a it's lot. Wild, yeah, it's like this wild conglomerate, or like a, it's like a, like a beautiful terrazzo of just different gems and things that, some like, hey, see these hundred rocks in here? Two of them are real, and then the rest, <laughs> I've made up. I'm not telling you which ones are real or not, or which part, you know. But yeah, the names have not been That's changed cool. to to spare the innocent. But I'm not telling you. It, it just blurs everything, right? It's 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 just like the memory. It's it's fragmented. It's fuzzy. There's some amnesia to it as well. Was it like that? What, was it not? I don't know. I mean, I love that he, like, he mentions Joan Didion very briefly in this in this section, and and it's like her with kind of being on that like one of those pioneers of creative nonfiction. Where did it snow? Does it matter if it snowed? Because it felt like it snowed to me, and that's kind of the whole point of this story that I'm telling. So who cares if I have it right or not? there's that aspect to it and he has that great story and i hope maybe it's in the book at some point where the actual rodrigo did meet joan didion in new york city randomly one time and i don't know how he always meets these people it's great i I love i know met met joan didion at a party in new york city too okay and like she was mad at him but yeah this this will be a great story that maybe shows up maybe doesn't but um yeah, the one that I, the one that I really hope, hope to tell, the one, the one I wish would show up, but I don't think shows up in here, is the one where he said that he met Susan Sontag once, and uh, they she's had mentioned lunch. in this section as well. She's mentioned in the section as well, but mm-hmm. not the story. But they had they had lunch, and he sat down, and she's like went on and on about Bolaño, and and she stopped talking. He said, "I don't know who you're talking about." <laughs> <laughs> that's, like a, that's like a joke it's like a punchline of a joke who are you who <laughs> uh, that's fantastic so good yeah and so good. and rodrigo actually on that tour did he did he have a lecture at cornell or did he just want to see the did he want to go there no. as a tourist to see the office you know i don't think he went I, so I, I, I might thought be he did because he wanted to see. I think he wanted to see the office. He made a special trip just so he could go to the office of of Nabokov, if I recall. But it doesn't matter. It's possible, but you know who I know did is Mikhail Shishkin, who is another one of our authors that came mm-hmm. to Rochester and did do an event in Cornell and did go to the office. And so I'm not sure if like I know that Shishkin did. And I feel like you're right that Frazan did as well. And that I told him, oh, Shishkin also did this. Um, which brings up a whole nother, nother point that I was going to make is that in this section, we also have his breakdown of the stories in uh, national industry. So national industry being the writer in the remembered parts first novel that was incredibly popular, which is, which happened with Frazan as well. He had a, a first book that was incredibly popular novel and stories. Everyone loves it. It continues to be like a big deal. And in here it breaks down those different stories 
And every one of those stories is sort of a recursive bit where it's like, we've seen this. It's again, the same things that we've seen over and over again. Again, it's made up, but again, it's like the stories I believe probably from that real book. Like everything's like sort of nested. And like, we talk a lot about like metafictional elements. And this is one where mm-hmm. I want to say like, it really is recursive where it's just like, like recursive being more of like the looking at the shape of the broccoli and the shape of the broccoli within the broccoli, within the broccoli, within the broccoli, where it gets the Matryoshka sort of vibe of it, where it just keeps repeating these things backwards and backwards and backwards, almost like trying to find that original bit, the original moment, which in this book is his potential drowning as a child where he becomes a writer. Um, And that being like the thing that then spurns everything else and everything's sort of like, just a replica, 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 replica of this initial ideas. Um, but I thought that that part was great too. Overall, I, this section was wonderful. And it, yeah. you, you tell me what parts you like, because I've gone on and on. Sure. I want to kick off um, a discussion, if you don't mind. Um, there is the, the part where it talks about having to speak about your work in public and re- giving public readings and how it's yep. basically, um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but it's basically like the, the, the perfect tropism for disaster, I think was the, uh, is what a reading basically is. You have, I've, I've attended a lot of readings. I've given a few myself. I know you have done a tremendous, uh, gone to a tremendous amount more re- readings what are some disastrous encounters? What are some disastrous moments that you can think of from any of the readings? Um, oh. the, it's, so so the, the section's around like 497. It says alone slash yeah, my, public. Um, do you have any that you remember as far as um, how terrible it is, to, how terrible it is to take something private, like being a writer and then putting it into the public and having a discourse about it? That part is really bad. Um, the two things I was thinking of, is like one, they were both with the same author, Curtis White. I once uh, scheduled a reading for him on Super Bowl Sunday without realizing it. Um, and nobody came. Okay. <laughs> that was a good one. He also did a reading in Seattle at Elliott Bay, I believe. Um, and one person showed up and it was a homeless person who complained that he was talking too loud. <laughs> Those are extremes. Yeah. So, here's this one quote says, and yes, if you think about it, there may be no greater form of humiliation for a writer or any artist than finding himself obliged to explain live and in person as if defending a terrible crime before a court, what he does and what he did and what he hoped to do in private. I had a really. Uh, I recall. I recall when uh, Frazan was giving his reading. Uh, there was a, I think it was a writing student or you know the young writer or whatever asked like, "How do you write your books?" There's this complex structure that's going on, and you know, like kind of, like going on and on and on. I don't know. You want to impress somebody, so you try to like formulate your question as really rather than just say what you want to ask you. You use all these, you know, 10 cent words and try to sound fancy in literary terms. So we asked this long question and uh, I think Rodrigo's answer was something like, um, I open up Microsoft Word and then um, I just kind of, you know, start writing in there and I just kind of put it, uh, some paragraphs together and then I save it and I'll come back to it and add to it. And then, you know, that's that's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he gives like the like I right. I don't want to explain this I don't want to get into this I don't <laughs> it was like the, so the much... funniest it took me everything not to just start laughing like it was such a great answer <laughs> uh, I, I think that there's, I think that everyone involved in a reading reading sucks on one level or another this is, sucks is maybe too harsh a word is it the, everyone's everyone's thing is flawed so the people why are people there. Like, why are people attending the reading and what are they expecting to have get out of What do they want to get out of it? And then when they start asking questions or which quote unquote questions, because 90% of them are never questions. What are they 
doing. And then for the well, reader, I have I know what I'm Go ahead. I know what, what I'm doing there usually is I'll typically try to find a first edition, first printing of their first book. I'm hoping to get it signed by that author so that if, you know, they die in a helicopter crash or something, I can put that on the eBay and I can make a couple of bucks off of it. That's I probably yeah. won't sell it, but I like to know that I have it. And they ask me who to make it out to. And I say, no one. I don't want this to be personally. I just want your signature. I don't want don't. Cause I'm going to sell this later. So <laughs> Some, I, I, I had an author. So I met with an author a uh, few of a uh, couple months ago in New York, um, who's very famous. Um, his name is Nicholas Del Banco and he helped found the university of Michigan. Er, he helped make the university of Michigan writing program huge. He found in Bennington's writing program. He was the professor for British and Ellis and Donna Tart and Jonathan uh, Lethem. And he's like a big deal in those, in those regards. Um, for sure. He's also one of the men referenced in Carly Simon's You're So Vain. Um, he's, he's like a figure. And he gave me, I'm, we're redoing, a, uh, we're doing a, a collection of his stories that includes two earlier books and a new, new, new book. And uh, so he had the two earlier books with him. And he's like, can I, he's like, I'm going to sign these for you. Is it okay if I put your name in it? And I had that moment where it's like, you're asking me as if like, <laughs> you assume I'm gonna sell them, like or yeah. something. But it's like, no, of course. Like, I, actually, I, I, I'm not. I'm not gonna sell them. I'd rather like have something, have a personal note. So he wrote like a long personal note about our correspondence. It was wonderful. But like, yeah, there's there's that angle. Like, I get that. Like, and the person who's reading, I, I like, are they're presumably trying to sell their books? But like, really? Because like generally you have like what t unless you're reading to an auditorium unless you've already made it on a level in which individual reading book sales will not matter like you are yeah. at the level where you are commanding you know ten thousand dollars speaker fees and five hundred people are showing up to your event who all already know your work or have your work or both um, you know you're reading to like a, a group of a, of a small group of people. And hoping that they buy your book? You're hoping to don't. sell 10 books. I know. You're hoping They're to sell 10 books it. is what you're doing. Yeah. So, so are you really, like, is the real truth of the matter that you're reading because you're hoping to meet one person who you had a, your book had an impact on, which is also mocked in this section, right? Like how much he hates when people come up and are like, your book changed, you changed my, my life. life. <laughs> 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 Probably for the worst. <laughs> Suck it. All right. So I, I have two disasters. One is the big one that you're talking about. Um, when I was in my MFA, we have a reading series. Uh, it's done by a, a wealthy lady that donates all the money for it. Um, and the the keynote for that season was uh, E.L. Doctorow. And uh, you can tell by my age, uh, we got E.L. Doctorow when he was a little bit advanced in, in his years obviously. So, um, but, uh, the, um, literary director of this, of this, uh, reading series, like that was his hero. He's, he's like a loves postmodernism, loves E.L. Doctorow book of Daniel was like one of his favorite books. So, uh, gets E.L. Doctorow out there and like, it was so phoned in, didn't care. It was like the worst, most torturous, like, what are we even doing here? I remember like, I was sitting next to a professor. I didn't even know. I was like, what, what is this? He's like, this is bad, man. This is so bad. <laughs> and just kind of like, he doesn't even like read anything new. He just reads like, uh, here's an early draft of something I wrote 15 years ago. I found it in my laptop on my flight out here. And like, he just read from that. And then I will, and then he goes, I will sign two books only at the end of this. So if you want a signature come up, you can, I will sign only two things and I'm only signing my name. I'm not making it out to anybody or anything. And then like, he just sits slumped in a chair and just signs people's books. And it was like, I can't believe we spent this much money on him to come out and do this. We're never doing this ever again. We're only doing young authors that have energy and care or, or whatever. Like, so that was one disaster. I mean, Go for ahead. not... Yeah, for a university perspective or for anyone hosting things, like what a fucking bind you're in. Like if you get yeah, if you yeah. if you try and get this this is the old Penworld Voices problem. Why 
Frazan got paired with Lethem is that if you don't have a name that people want to come out for mixed with someone who's hungry, like you end up mm-hmm. with a disaster either way. Nobody shows up because they don't know who it is or everybody shows up and that person's kind of a prick. Um, yep. Not to not to generalize grossly about every author, but I don't know. Related, just to just interject for one second, um, I, going back to Andre, he talked about being in academia and going to a conference and he was like, they finally, there was this, the big keynote was going to be this American professor who flew over to wherever they were, going to give this amazing keynote. Everyone was so excited. And he's like, and they got there and all they did was talk about, like, make jokes about what they ate on their flight and like how boring it was <laughs> and, and like all these things. And didn't really give us presentation. I was like, oh shit, I wonder if I ever flew to there and gave a presentation because <laughs> that sounds like what I would have done. Sounds like exactly like what you would do, actually. <laughs> Okay, and the other disaster, which I thought was awesome. I love this disaster. This one was great. It offended so many people, but it was kind of, the, that was the whole point of it, was um, it was a smaller reading series, and they brought in Sherman Alexi. And oh, uh, this, was before his, yeah. this was before his, uh, you know, affairs and wanting to be, you know, me too and being canceled type of thing. It was, it was a few years before that, but somebody asked, the big topic was, um, do you think that the what do you think about artists and being um controversial and they brought up uh salmon rushdie um and if salmon um deserved to have the fatwa put on him and and uh i don't know what they were expecting from him but there was like this little like kind of gleam in sherman's eye before he answered and he kind of smirked he was like absolutely he deserves everything that comes to him how dare you say stuff like like he went on this tire like, and like you could hear like people Holy actually shit. gasp and like people started leaving and like he was like I think he basically just said I'm really bored with doing this and so I'm gonna give like I'm gonna just give you an answer that you don't want for a question that I don't want to answer or what <laughs> and it was again it just completely floored everybody and then you know like I- for later for him to be stabbed in the neck and in, in in Buffalo or whatever I mean this was a decade oh, later man. when that happened. But yeah, like, holy cow, like that one was just not what anybody expected. Sherman Alexi gave a a reading at Illinois State University when I was there for Delkey. And there was a woman who was there. There There's like a reception afterwards, I believe. Uh, Yeah, it would have had to be afterwards. I was hanging out at the reception, talked to him. And this woman came and she was very, let's say, scantily clad. And I was like, oh, do you, are you like, what are you here for? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, I'm here to fuck Sherman Alexi. And I was like, oh, okay. And uh, sure enough, saw the two of them leave <laughs> together towards the end of that that evening, pre all the Me Too stuff, pre all the other stuff, but like exactly Alleged. that. Not necessarily Alleged. Alleged. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Zoom. That's yeah. probably a part of this. I know, not- I know for me, oh. um, when I was going to readings and stuff, especially when I was um, in school, I was like hoping to get like some magic, some magic advice, like, like that magic miracle pill that would help me lose weight. Like I, I, I wanted like a quick fix. Like, how do I become a writer? What, like, give me how to write an outline. Tell me how to, how do you start your story? Like, like you're looking for that. Like, I, I know for me as a writer, you'd go to those and you're hoping to get some kind of advice of like, each person has their own way of how they cracked through that wall and how they made it to get published. And I wanted to be published so badly. Um, I wanted to know like when really all it is, is like, just instead of being here, why don't you go home and sit in your chair and write something and keep writing something and read something and keep reading something like do that. But all I wanted was tell me how you got your agent. Tell me how, your agent sold your book. Tell me how you got your idea for your book. How did you write your book? Like I wanted, I was just like grasping at anything I could get and collecting anything I could on how somebody made it so that I could emulate or mirror their success. And I, I know, I know for me, that was, I, I went to every single reading. I, I devoured everything somebody wrote trying to, trying to emulate their success. So you so were more, interested, you were much more interested in seeing Ikea read than in seeing our X writer read. (laughs) 
honestly, I was interested in finding, I, I just, I just wanted to learn from anybody and everybody. And so I went to every reading. I went to all the poetry readings. I went to all of the nonfiction readings, the fiction readings. I, I, re I, I went to every single person because I was in this mode of like, I'm going to make it. I want to make it. And I, I want to be a writer. Um, and I want to be a published writer. Like it was really important to me. And so um, I foolishly went to all these things um, just hoping to just like scrap together some crumbs and like figure out a path on how to make it. I've, you know, we're going to bang this, bang this idea to, a, to, a, to, uh, into nothing. I don't know. Bang the drum, the, um, beat a dead horse, the, but in terms of the readings, there's another element to it that I think one of the reasons I've always wanted to go to, if I want to go to a reading, generally I go because I go to event. I like events. I like conversations that are sure. actually like, that that misstep people. I want people to feel. I want the authors. I want the performers to feel like left footed at some point, and that they, then they're honest rather than mm -hmm. uh, things that they've already rehearsed. And on the exact opposite side, I want a spectacle. I want to see someone perform for me <laughs> as and sure. entertain me. And so uh, I'm one of those one of those things. One of the other people that came to Illinois State was was Christopher Hitchens, and hanging out with him. Mm -hmm before his events and afterwards and during his events like he was it was at the height of his when everyone hated him the most for like being pro uh, iraq war he was like on that that sort of like libertarian crazy side of politics he where he'd gone from being extremely liberal left-wing progressive into like his own sort of strange world and he Did gave he have a column what, was he an esquire man what's that was he at writing with for Esquire when he had been writing for the nation and, um, the nation, and, sorry. and okay. he had just been, he had been fired from the nation like right then. And, um, he, okay. I mean, he loves a lot of books that I love and he loved, he's mm -hmm. passed away now, obviously, but he was like, gave a performance. And in some ways, like if writers were more like the, like I'd go see a band that, because I want to see the performance. I like to see a band perform. Sure. I like to see it live. And there's something dynamic and interesting about that that I don't think readings ever really naturally capture. And instead, there's like this fraught entanglement between um, audience and performer that's very different in the world of music and very different in the world of like comedy, which are the two ones that come to mind as kind like, of parallel. Say something, stand for something, and be un unapologetic about it. In some and ways. do your thing. Which, do your fucking yeah, which, thing. Which you don't have that much anymore. Like, like a feminist, like uh, like when we were reading um, Virginine, right? Like I would want to go to yeah. one of her readings and I'd want to hear how she I answers questions, know. right? It's the same way like with like Camille Paglia, like with like, like with like within feminism with like Camille Paglia where she's like kind of not, not very popular because she, she says things that people don't like. Like how dare you try to tell, how dare you try to change pronouns? Well, who do you think you are? Like, well, you're not supposed to say that. That's not in line with, Right. Like that kind of stuff. It's it's very uh, it kind of makes your hair stand up. And that's you know, you're going to pay attention to that. And it doesn't have like, to like, be like, like but no, it's yeah. Perform yeah, it's I think it's why like I finished yeah. reading uh, Catherine Lacey's biography of X, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is about if you don't know this book, Brian, it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to be disparaging of it, but I also don't want to say that it's a great, amazing book because I think it's like pretty middle. But um. But it's an interesting book in which a, a, a woman has been married to this character who's essentially like a performance artist who goes through a variety of different like names, um, like looks, styles, does, and is very Kathy, Kathy Acker's a character in it, Bowie's a character in it. It's very much that sort of vibe. And, um, and the telling of that and the, the reliance upon performance rather than art. Like the, the art itself is bullshit, but the performance of it is what's interesting, um, is one of the messages of the book. I think that that's pretty, I mean, I think that's different than what Frazan's talking about in here, but I think that that's maybe more of where my appeal is. Anyways, we should get back onto the book to some degree. Well, here, here, we'll, we'll, finish the, we'll finish this with this, with this here on page uh, 501. Uh, with national industry in his hand, that the humiliations inflicted on writers away from their desk revolved around various um, 
recurrent situations worth putting on a multiple choice test? A, that nobody shows up at the venue. B, discovering without prior warning that you were participating on a panel with a colleague you'd always hated. C, that the only people at the event were people you didn't want to see for anything in the world. D, uh, there'd be some kind of lunatic that tells you that this book, quote, changed my life. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, E, the person presenting and or interviewing you hadn't read the book. (laughs) Or to your face confused you with another writer. (laughs) Uh, F, that the writer was drunk to the point of vomiting or nervous to the point of nausea and ended up behaving in a very inappropriate way. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So it's so good. The whole this part is just wonderful. Like he is firing on all cylinders. Um God, I don't even know where to go from here. I do have more notes. I but... really like the part right after this though, um, where he starts braiding together um Nabokov uh Dunn talking about Dunn and, and time and the so uh that, that kind of like postmodernist fragmentation of time and then the way he's doing that with uh Nabokov Dunn and then later with um Vonnegut I thought it was just really brilliant in this section and like the the the, the time thing um we talked about this for a second before we got started and I forget exactly what it was you said, but with the time thing, I think is really interesting because these books operate outside of time. Like the, the, you, if you want to create a time and you can create a plot line, I suppose, mm-hmm. but essentially this could be this, this entire trilogy could be the moment all within the mind of the, the writer at the moment where he's burning utter ardor in the desert in Mexico remembering everything else mm-hmm. like a, like a snow globe situation um uh where you, i mean that's not it, it could be like in some ways but like there it is it is because it's memory and because memory is fallible and because memory is absolute in terms of like reconstructing and allowing you to tell narrative through your memory that are false that designed to create a structure all of these books sort of fit into like the telling of the past, even with the invented part, like it's trying to invent a moment, but it's inventing a moment that then becomes a thing that's remembered. Um, and that was a dream. Like that interplay is such a brilliant three part mm-hmm. structure and three, three little components of creation and of writing and of, of everything that you can reconfigure them over and over and over and over again and use the same little, 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 little tiny plot and have that be, this huge gigantic thing. So like everything, when you're talking about time, there is no time in this book. The time doesn't matter. Time doesn't progress. Yeah. It's like different remember moments of past times, future potential times, imagined times, written times. There's no time here whatsoever. And so it does have that kind of Vonnegut aspect to it of the living all moments at once. Um, which reminds me of Invented Part with all seven sections being written simultaneously um, and kind of occurring simultaneously. But this also like that it is it is disconnected from like a mm-hmm. traditional sense of time, especially within like traditional sense of contemporary literature. Yeah, I, I like too that he, he also weaved in Borges into that part as well. It kind of, you know, one of my favorite stories by Borges was, um, I think it's called this, The Secret Miracle, where it's someone, someone's facing a firing squad. And the moment before um, the writer is going to die, he's given this gift where time stops and he can write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and have the perfect piece, you know, and then, you know, bang, the story, the story ends. Like it, yeah. it, it's, which I thought like that, that idea of time and time's only going one direction, but we can remember, my, remember, 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 remember as we're vaulted forward. It was uh, my, my favorite yeah, is the really, really great. Story. My favorite is the Pune story in which the kid can't forget anything, which no. ties really much into this too, no. which I remember reading that in college and being like, Holy shit, this is the worst thing that could happen to you in your life. Um, I do want to say not to be, not to be snarky, but to be a little snarky is that the bit about um, the University of Rochester and one of his like 
bits about the U of R is that all the students have Vonnegut tattoos. Um, either like the, <laughs> like in the lines, I would I would hazard I would I would guess that less than five percent of the students in the English department or humanities department as a whole have read Vonnegut at the University of Rochester. <laughs> so I don't know. I think if you're talking about irreality and like invention, that's a good one. That that one's that one's out there. That's that's pretty much like aliens. That reminds me, if we go back to comedy, I forget which comedian it was, but he saw um, Megan Fox at some event, and she has a large tattoo of Marilyn Monroe on her forearm. Yeah. Um, and his joke was like, oh, I've, I've got a tattoo of Joe DiMaggio on my forearm. And she says, who? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like that idea, like, here's my, here's my Kurt Vonnegut tattoo. And it's like, oh, that's from Breakfast of Champions. What's that? Wheaties? Yep. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> never mind. That's all right. Like, <laughs> we actually like, had, it by the cool. way, whatever. Before I forget, um, there was, we have a, we had someone write in last week and I don't want to forget about this as you look through for other things you want to talk about, but we had someone write in with a few questions for us. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to sort of skip over. Uh, I mean, the first one is about a specific section, which we will get back to. Um, that's from pages 308 to 312 about the trustworthiness of the plan for the overarching trilogy from the X writer. Let's come back to that on a different week because I that will recur. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a question that was about whether some of the things that are maybe typos or maybe intentional are an indicator of the narrator losing their mind and losing their memory. So for instance, and I think this, I'm pretty sure this is a typo, is that on, uh, I think it's on page 41, the narrator, narrator refers to Jules Verne's 2,000 leagues under the sea instead of 20,000 leagues under the sea. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a reference to Roberta Sparrow instead of Robert Sparrow. There's like a few errors early on <clears throat> where he's like, is this, you know, is that, is that, is the irony that, that these, that these are, uh, that the narrator is unreliable and that his memory is slipping, which I don't should, know if that's The answer true. to that is yes. And you need to put more of them in. <laughs> that but just feels like, oh. but but to me that just it screams of a a mistake that was made on a hundred you know hundred plus thousand word manuscript uh, yeah and there is that is uh there okay but the last two i think are interesting questions and i'm going to read yeah. these in full that i think are, are more pertinent to the moment i haven't heard you or gus acknowledge that the narrator is a tiresome asshole i know he tries to anticipate this by calling himself a <laughs> <laughs> they refuge in the tired and baseless club that all good art has to be made by bastards. But like most assholes, he seems unaware of a lot of the ways in which he displays his um, assholery. Don't you find his sense of grievance and snobbery wearing? Yeah, it's true that most people are puzzled or baffled by this type of discursive fiction. So what? That doesn't make them deficient or less than. For someone who's obsessed with the carnival that is his own mind, the narr narrator seems singularly unable to recognize that other people, non-writers, might also have their own equally entertaining carnivals in their heads, even in especially carnivals he wouldn't understand. Am I alone in feeling this about him? And it's interesting. I meant to, I started to reply. <laughs> and one of the weeks when you couldn't be here, when uh, Kai was on, mm -hmm. I had that as a note is narrator is fucking asshole. was the only note that I wrote down. Um, and well, you're adding to that. I did. I, well, yeah. I mean, I chatted it. <laughs> I added a chat to it. Um, yeah. but, the, but, but no, seriously, I was like, man, this guy is really, he is insufferable. Like if you were sitting next to him on a, on a plane and had to hear all this, you'd just be like, come on, get over it. Move along. Like, I've got a work call I have to take, but there's no cell service. The thing about cell phones actually, and then they go into like a, a 20,000 word discourse on how the Blackberry became a, it's like, what have you not read? You don't have to tell me everything you <laughs> <laughs> my ears are stopping my battery is dead no but yeah like seriously like he is an asshole but but i don't know i mean it's sort of endearing that someone can be an asshole no i mean it's it's very purposefully maximalist um 
what should we include everything yeah and then and actually i have a little i, I mean thank god there's no footnotes right right but i mean but it's also in his attitude like in the attitude of things it's sort of it doesn't it's not that far away I and mean, there's a fine line i think between like really wanting like the books that go back to the untranslated go back to the untranslated books which are mm -hmm. definitely not for everyone like not everyone's sure. going to enjoy or appreciate those and yet people who do deserve to have that experience and this is an experience of someone who is and this is where you start to get into like a really gradiated area in today's cancel cancel culture for lack of a better term um where where his assholery is interesting to watch because we don't always get to see assholery um and to, to let that be on the page is kind of nice like it's yeah. not it doesn't apologize it sort of like frames itself as like yeah i'm a piece of shit like here's my piece of shitness um and that's and that's that's what it is but it's it's kind of refreshing to actually let that be um in some ways though ooh. it, it because i I get. I think it becomes a question of of proportion. Because I remember when we, were, when we were reading Ducks Newberry Port, like by about page five hundred, six hundred, it's like okay, like like Shoot I get it already. The, the the world, the world Spoiler is alert. It's a, it's a very it's a very scary place, and it's it's dangerous, and it sucks. And like okay, we're, we're doing it again. I mean, here's another hundred pages. We just did this hundred pages ago. All right, we're doing it again, and like, but maybe that's the point of it, right? Like, because it yeah. goes on and on and on and on. But I think it, I think I think he was also the 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 person who wrote these questions also just put in a comment that you're gonna love. Um, yeah, they uh, they uh, I think they're referring less to the even the part of it, but just that simply like his viewpoint isn't is 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 like being he would be an asshole, not just tiresome, but would be like someone right. you're like what a prick. Like that guy's such a prick, and it would be the same if it was someone who's like someone who I don't know went on about how awesome Fast and the Furious movies were and never talked about anything else. <laughs> You'd be like that guy's a prick. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, that prick deserves to have their prick times. I don't know. So <laughs> Benjamin Chambers writes in. A fellow student in my MFA program once did a public reading of a story that was a Romana cleft about the affairs that one of the professors was having with multiple students. Oh, snap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you win a prize for that. Yes. <laughs> so one of the other question, though, that I think is really, is really pertinent and is a good point, point to leave, leave off with like the plotting of this of this sure. section and then I'm going to drop something in and then we'll do our last last lines or whatever. But he says, also, I haven't heard, uh, I haven't heard anyone mention the narrator's references to his impending suicide. What's going on there. It's very difficult to fix the narrator's position and destination in the remembered part, especially since in the early section, he's metaphorically in the desert. Are Mount, Mount Karma and Abacadabra metaphorical destinations for his death? Is suicide only a kind of natural conclusion to the living death of a writer who can't write? Or will he stumble off the plane drunk and bleary and write the trilogy we're now holding? Also, I want to point out, which I forgot to frame that with, is that the, um, Benjamin, who wrote this in, um, did not read Invented or Dream Park. Just took the advice of episode one and started with this, this, this book. That's pretty rad. I like that. So, yeah, the suicide thing we have not talked about at mm. all. Like there are numerous references to that, to like the sort of end of it. He's going to end everything. He's going to burn the book in the desert. It's all over. Well, it was mentioned too, you know, in this, what a disaster these public readings are. I mean, it mentioned someone, you know, shooting himself in the face yeah. um, at a reading. So suicides throughout this book. I mean, it is, and it is almost like the, the death of the author written, mm -hmm. written, Writ like saying, I mean, writ obviously, writ large, whatever the phrasing is supposed to be there. Um, but yeah, yeah like, it makes you wonder if it's going to be one of those like, like, why would you metaphorical cl closing the book? Right? Why would you? Yeah, closing the book's another good cliche for that. Um, but why would you keep writing if you can't write and your writing is what you are? Then why do you go? What do you? What do you do? He's just like a caretaker for his sister's, like financial largesse and success 
he's a failure that nobody wants to read his books and doesn't want to invite him anywhere anymore because he's a fucking run on prick. Look at this. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, but then there's also the there's the threat of the of the child. The, right. The, okay. So the threat he, of the child. He who shall not be he who shall not be named. Yeah. I feel like that needs to be might be tied up. But I don't want to I don't want to guess because I'll just sound stupid. So. I can enough. do that on my own. I can do that on my own easy enough. <laughs> so as you look for your, so I don't think there, is there anything else from this? I don't even know if there's anything there's else. A, on this. There was a bunch, but that's fine. We can, we can anything say next week. No, anything important that you want to throw in there? Let's, let's, let's got time. No, no, no. I just, I just really enjoyed um, the, the parts about the desk and the tomb was fun just because I, firsthand heard a couple of those stories when we were at dinner yep. um and then yeah i, I really like the stuff with uh, john william dunn and i'm not familiar with uh, his work so i want to read some of that so uh, there's i'm really excited to check him out that that reminded me that there's a part in look at the harlequins that he references where the character that is look at the harlequins by nabokov is kind of a faux um autobiography of nabokov where everything's like sort of like through the looking glass and one of the things in there is, I think it's, it's not Joseph Gardner. What's the guy's name? There's like a mathematician, Martin Gardner, um, that is referenced within the book who references Nabokov in his works. Um, but uh, the character in Look at the Harlequins is it's impossible for him to envision things reversed, which is like a, a particular like mathematical term there's a mathematical term for it but also like a psychological way of doing it that part's great too because the these books kind of force you to try and see things as three-dimensional objects i think and see them as and maybe that's just me because i'm obsessed with structure and reading but see them as a whole um and see them in ways that you can reverse and move them around and the nabokov part of that is i think is really interesting because i think nabokov also like saw things as massive superstructures in the way that like his character in that book do, or in uh, Look at the Harlequins cannot do simply because he cannot physically imagine things being in any other way than like a straight one to one to one line. Um, while you're looking for your last line or for whatever you want to, whatever thing you want to bring up, I will say that the next book for season 20, I'm going to announce on the website uh, next week as part of an ongoing uh, series. It, I will give you a clue. It will be a Delkey Archive book because it will be part of the Reading the Delkey Archive series I've been writing, and one of which came out earlier this week on Momus's The Book of Jokes, which I quite like because that one's all about stand-up comedy. But the next one that comes out is going to announce that it will be the book that we're doing for season 20. So for anyone listening to this, if you want to find out, you're going to have to read that. This is what I think they call cross-promotion. Um, you're going to have to read that article, visit the website, which is just set rochester.edu slash 3%. You will get there. Um, you It will be up there on Tuesday if all goes well. And that's where you can find out what the next season's book is. Um, did you find a line that you would like to share as your line of the week? Yeah, page 504. I feel like uh, John Dunn was kind of the secret to this all along, right? 504, mm -hmm. uh, about a third of the way down. And that all of this, the combination of inventions and dreams and memories was only experienceable and possible to perceive and to see with eyes closed, sleeping yet so um, conscious of other things. Love it. Love it. Mine is uh, from the very beginning of the section that we read, page 492. And this is from uh, Uncle Hey Walrus. <laughs> hey, Uncle Walrus. <laughs> uncle hey walrus now i'm not sure like i'm so uncertain of myself it starts with uncle it starts with uncle you got uncle it. hey walrus says i am there he's talking about being listening to the beatles make the beatles and he says i am there and obviously it's not the best background music for a psychotic <laughs> okay i love that i love 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 that and uh the we didn't get to talk about cocaine which is the other thing I wanted to talk about, <laughs> not, not as like a drug I've ever, ever done, <laughs> but like simply because it's like one of those that's like legendary for like creative, like 
juice and that's how it's used in this book a lot and there's so many good parts about like the writer becoming addicted to coke or not addicted but using cocaine and various people not needing cocaine because they already have so many ideas in their head that they don't need that i think that part's fun um i think this section was wonderful uh i meant to look at to how far we go for next week as i was saying that and i forgot but you can find it it'll be linked to in the show notes it's about 70 pages from where we are. So it's probably like six, uh, I'll bet you it's to page 643 because that's the end of part two. Um, and that would wrap that section up, but we are into the home stretch with the remembered part with the trilogy as a whole. And we will be back next week for that. In the meantime, you can rate and review us on podcasts apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts you can follow us on twitter in, i don't think on instagram but on twitter um there's a two-month review twitter there's also chad to post there's also brian wood underscore which i know you don't use um again every time i go to type in a tweet to try and tag you about two month review now the person who shows up i don't know why but I, when i put in br at br the first thing that comes up as a choice is britney spears I'm always tempted to just click on just, and see what would just happen. Just keep sending it to her. I'm sure, it, sure it's she'll love it. It's never you because you don't use Twitter. It never wants me to choose you. It wants me to choose yeah. anyone else with a BR. Um, but Britney Spears, I think I'll <laughs> tag this week just to see what happens. Um, but otherwise, you can you can follow us there, rate reviews, tell your friends, do whatever you want to do, uh, read the untranslated. Uh, Stay safe. Go Vikings. Go Vikings.